is Julianne Good, and this is Psych One on One. Welcome. We are here to make psychology more understandable with tips for you, your family, and friends to make your lives more manageable. Tonight, I have a very special guest in in the studio, almost at the office. It almost feels like it sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is Officer Dion Joseph. He That's is right. the LAPD lead officer and the Skid Row District. We are going to be talking about the Skid Row population, mental illness, and the women in particular who are popul- the population and the citizens down here, a major portion right now. Right. Yes. So welcome. Thank you so much for being in studio. Thank you for having me. Uh, happy to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Can you give the listening audience a little bit of a background? Well, my background is uh, 20 years in the Los Angeles Police Department, uh, 18 of those years in Skid Row, uh, initially not by choice, <laughs> you know, but uh, once I came here, I fell in love with it and uh, never really left with the exception of one year when I went to work with juveniles in Newton Division and then came back. Uh, I've been 10 years as the lead officer and, and in charge of uh, creative, creating, creating uh, creative crime fighting strategies to try to reduce crime, fear of crime, as well as uh, improve quality of life and kind of bridge the gap between our division, Central Division, and the people we serve so we can uh, really, really uh, uh, bolster the community policing aspect of uh, uh, helping people help themselves to keep crime down and keep themselves safe. Yeah, that's great. I mean, you must be tremendously busy. It's extremely busy. Uh, It is a labor of love. Uh, I can be anywhere in the city, but I chose to be here because you, after a while, you know, the people you serve, especially being a senior lead officer, the people you serve tend to become your family, your second family. And uh, I never left because I really want to try to create an environment uh, conducive to change so that the influence of the real heroes, the service providers, the 107 programs in Skid Row can have a stronger influence over the community than the criminal element. And there are hundreds of them preying on the vices of the people. Uh, you have to understand what Skid Row truly is. Uh, you know, it's been called the homeless capital of America, and uh, it's an accurate description. Uh, you know, uh, it's a recovery zone. Uh, it's a recovery zone because, as I said before, 107 programs designed to help from drug programs, shelters that have support services for people in drug programs, mental health programs, housing programs. And, uh, and it, it, because it's a recovery zone in downtown L.A., mm-hmm. in Skid Row, it attracts two groups of individuals. Uh, obviously, individuals who are poor, homeless, or disenfranchised that can't afford to go to the places where your favorite celebrity goes to get clean. Betty Ford, Malibu Passages, great organizations where they do yoga, they... Uh, Horses running around, it's green, all to get them away from the temptation to fail or fall off the wagon, so to speak. Uh, But the people of Skid Row, for the most part, are disenfranchised. That's why they end up there. So because they're disenfranchised or dysfunctional, uh, they have to get clean in in the middle of what could be compared to a drug bazaar. Now, because many of the people in Skid Row come from South L.A., Watts, Compton, Long Beach, the predators tend to... follow them from there because they know they're addicts in Skid Row. So it attracts the latter element, which is the hundreds and hundreds of gang members who come down here, Crips and Bloods, actually working together to sell drugs, not only mm-hmm. outside the drug program, but some of them end up in the program claiming they want to, they've been ordered there or they want to see their auntie, which is cold word for somebody who worked for me mm-hmm. <laughs> in selling drugs. So the temptation to fail is too great. And so many people fall through the cracks. It's not that the programs in Skid Row don't work. I've seen it. I, I was a big disbeliever in the missions until I came uh, and had what, became a senior lead officer, was kind of forced to take a tour. And I saw individuals who I arrested years ago who, when I arrested them, I said, there is no hope for this person. But this person is now running a drug program. Wow. This person is now a counselor. So, And they would tell me, I said, Joseph, you know, Thank God, thank my higher power that I've changed. But if you guys don't take care of what's happening out there, I don't know how long I'm going to last. So at that point in 2006, I was really inspired to really, really try to help uh, support the missions, the drug programs, SRO housing programs, Skid Row Housing Trust, in doing their job better. And it's a tough task because, unfortunately, Skid Row has become politicized. The lives of the homeless has become used as a political football for people on the far left and the far life, right, far right. How has that happened? What, what was the synopsis of, of that situation? The synopsis is this. Um, you have people on one side of the coin who for decades believe in nimbyism. Not in my backyard. Get these homeless, poor people out of our communities. Oh, nephew comes on from jail. We can't handle him. 
ship them off to Skid Row because they have quote unquote services there. And that's what happened. We have cities all over the county who do, did that for decades. Uh, and sadly, uh, you have people who come down from that same vein and to feel good about themselves, not saying they're all bad people, their hearts are in the right place. Right. They want to give food and clothes to them in a place where you there's too much food and clothes. There, you can't starve in Skid Row when the mission served 9,000 meals a day, but it draws everybody to the area. So, you know, then you have the other extreme. You have the super, super, super left who truly believe that because people are poor, homeless, disenfranchised, that law enforcement, everybody should just take their hands off and let them do what they want to do because that's all they have. And one side, uh, the NIMBYs, put the people in like this asylum without walls or concentration camp without walls, for lack of a better term. And then you have the other side, the super, super left, who because they successfully, when the winds are blowing in their direction, tie our hands, they put the people in so much danger. And it's been this never-ending battle between crime control and due process advocates in Skid Row. And uh, I'm a crime control advocate, but I agree that if crime control advocates have too much power, people can get hurt. And we're also seeing what we're seeing now is now we see the due process advocates. The winds are blowing, winds are blowing totally in their direction. Mm -hmm. They're getting everything they want. And unfortunately, because now everything's going in their favor, uh, now, unfortunately, people are in danger, you know, and it's really, really a horrific uh, what I'm seeing down there. And it's a shame that uh, many people can't put down their political optics, whether it's right or left, and come to the middle with us and let's come up with common sense solutions uh, to fixing this problem in a, in a, in a humane way that actually works. Um, everything's being run off of theories now, you know, you know, but I know what works. I've been in Skid Row 20 years, uh, 18 years. I know what fails. I know what works, but because sometimes the uniform I wear, uh, it can be polarizing. You know, they say, you're, yeah, we know you're telling the truth, Joseph, but you work for the police. And that's got to change too, because we don't have a dog in the fight. Yeah. Uh, we're police officers. Uh, I'm not working for either side. You know, I respond to where the stats are. Um, Skid Row oftentimes accounts for 45 to 60 percent of uh, all of our crime and uh, mostly our violent crime, aggravated assault. In L.A. County alone? No, I'm talking about in Central Division, our 4.5 okay. 4. Okay. miles of territory. Because right. Central Division is not just Skid Row. Skid Row is Chinatown and all these other places where hundreds of thousands of people live. But, and probably millions come to shop and everything else. Mm -hmm. like, but still, with all those people going in those other places, in this 50-block radius we call Skid Row, it accounts for 45 to 50 percent of all the crime and some of the most heinous crimes happen there. Mm -hmm. So we're not there because of people's socioeconomic status. We're not there because of their racial background or anything. That We're there because the stats lead us there, and that's common sense. You know, I mean, I mean, I, let's just take my life, for instance. You know, I, I live in a community with, I hate this word, minorities, because there's nothing minor about me or the people I live with. Right. We're all beautiful. But uh, we're black, Hispanic, you know, Samoan, Filipino, and I only see the police uh, once a month just to drive by and say, hey, we're here mm -hmm. <laughs> because there's no crime. If my neighbor owes me $2 next door, I'm not going to bust him upside the head with a brick to get it. Uh, in Skid Row, in this community, uh, if you owe $2, that could get you killed. Uh, if my neighbor across the street owes me $150, uh, I'm not going to wake him up, tie him up, and make his girlfriend or wife you know, sell her body until I get my money back. Well, in this community, they will, and that's the difference. You know, it's not their skin color that's their sin. It's not their social economic uh, background that's their sin. But it's the crime that draws us to uh, uh, to the area to try to combat it. And unfortunately, even that's become politicized. And as and as a result, people are being hurt. They're more exposed to crime and everything else. So what are some of the most common crimes that are occurring in Skid Row? The most common crimes that we're seeing right now, uh, let's, talk, let's talk about property crime first. Uh, because of the level of things that people are, are collecting on the sidewalks, uh, you're, you're, they, they're not able to manage it. And so it's easy for someone to go to sleep and wake up and have their ID stolen or wallets or any valuable thing, phones and things like that. But that's important. But what's more important to me is human life. When we're seeing aggravated assaults, because because of the same issue with all the stuff out there, people are beating each other with whatever they can get their hands on, pipes, chairs, milk crates. It's bedlam. It's complete bedlam in there. Uh, we've had robberies. You'll have a poor guy walking down the streets and he'll get jumped by 10 people at the same time, kicked and beaten until he gives up his wallet. This is becoming more commonplace, uh, uh, sadly, uh, than, than we'd, <laughs> we'd like to see it, obviously. Uh, and then rapes. Uh, you know, it's a huge issue right now uh, for me. 
uh, Skid Row, the population of Skid Row, uh, about 40% of that population is made up of women. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're the most marginalized, obviously. Uh, now, out of that 40%, two-thirds of them have been victims of sexual crime more than once. Yeah, probably even before they got to Skid Row, correct? Before and then even more so after because it's a very male-dominant, uh, uh, very chauvinistic society. You'll have girls coming down there with nothing and some guy will say, well, you come with me, you know, I'll take you under my wing. And next thing you know, she's being trafficked, you know, in Skid Row. And, uh, and of course, the drugs uh, take effect and uh, uh, she ends up on that spiral and she gets used, unfortunately. And it's just, it's just a horrific scene. Um, one of the crimes, uh, we've had kidnappings, we've had uh, uh, batteries. It's just really getting out of control since about 2010. So what changed since 2010? Do you know? I mean, obviously, since 2008 and the, the economic crisis happened, mm-hmm. a lot more people are ending up homeless. Mm-hmm. And I know that that is a definite c- contributing factor there. Well, let's backtrack a little bit. Okay. Uh, from 2006 to 2000. Now, let's talk about Skid Row prior to 2005. Mm-hmm. It was what we see now, Bedlam. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, then 2006 to 2010, we had the Safer Cities Initiative, which was a three-pronged approach to uh, dealing with the high level of crime and poor quality of life in Skid Row through a three-pronged approach. Uh, the first approach, obviously, was enforcement. The reason why was because there were many people in Skid Row because of the lack of resources we had to deal with the problem who got the sense that Skid Row was a place where we basically have the civil rights to kick, our, kick each other's butt and nobody cares. Well, it wasn't that we didn't care. We didn't have the resources. So... Uh, we got the resources. We had to go in there. We had to make a lot of arrests. Uh, a lot of tickets were written. And uh, it was responsible for a reduction in about 40%, uh, 40% reduction in all crimes. Uh, because through that, uh, we were able to identify a couple thousand parolees uh, who were hiding in Skid Row or being sent there. I mean, imagine being a parolee and then having your agent say, hey, go to Skid Row. And by the way, stay out of trouble. Mm, right. <laughs> and all you have is $221 to survive. Wow. And then some gangster saying, hey, you want to work for me? That's pretty enticing. Sure. 3,000 people who are on probation or Prop 36 or former probation uh, and violent crimes who were in Skid Row. And we also ended up identifying hundreds of sex offenders who were in Skid Row. And, uh, and as a result, we kind of restored order. Uh, and then we engaged in what's called enhancements. Uh, uh, Skid Row was the most marginalized area of the city. Uh, you know, it never was really taken care of or clean. It was uh, insurmountable, the level of uh, uh, filth and disease that was going on there. So working with other city entities, we, uh, of course, put slats in the sidewalk for the handicapped. We were able to clean the sidewalks and make sure they were open for safe patches for the handicapped uh, and uh, deal with a lot of the clutter and the things that gave the criminal element a grip on the community, put up street lights. Imagine being a woman in 2005 in Skid Row where the street lights are out and you go to sleep and you wake up and your butt hurts or your uh, vaginal area hurts and you don't know how it happened to you. And uh, especially if you're mentally ill, you can't articulate what happened to you when you think your attacker was Santa Claus. Right. You know? Well, yeah, and especially if you're in the dark, you can't even see who your attacker <laughs> is. Absolutely. So through the enhancements, it really helped putting up those street lights, clearing the sidewalks, and uh, just creating an environment where people felt it was a real community. As a matter of fact, through doing so, we had some dedicated members of the Skid Row, actual members of the Skid Row communities, not outsiders coming in, uh, who would clean the streets and sweep the streets better than the city did. And it was a fantastic, we inspired the community to start taking their community back. And then lastly, through, uh, and the mo- through the most important cr- uh, prong was outreach. Uh, this was not widely publicized to the general public, unfortunately, but we had a program called SOS or Streeter Services in which certain individuals were arrested for minor crimes if they didn't hurt anybody. Um, if we knew that mental illness, drug addiction or alcohol addiction uh, or chronic homelessness was what was driving them to commit those crimes, if we arrested you, we offered you alternatives to jail. I think we were the only division in the department or nationwide who was doing something that it was revolutionary in my mind and we loved it. Uh, because even many of us agree that there are certain individuals because they're sick, uh, you know, they're driven to commit crimes. But you know, even if we arrest them, I don't want them to go to jail for the rest of their lives, but there has to be teeth. So what we did was we said, uh, okay, we're going to bring you in. If you sign up for this program uh, for to meet whatever need you have and you complete it, we rip up the charges if it never exists. 
existed. And 2,225 individuals uh, signed up. And uh, of course, not all of them <laughs> completed it. About I, I think it was about 30% who actually did. And that's not a failure in my right, mind. Exactly. That, At least they started it. And how long was the program? And, and does it, a, it still exist? It was a 21-day program, uh, yeah. to, uh, to the best of my recollection. Yeah. Uh, and uh, like I said, some of them signed it and says, I'll sign it. And they went right back out to destroy themselves. And then warrants went out for the rest. And we tried it again. Mm -hmm. But for the people who were successful, these are individuals who finally started seeking housing, uh, taking advantage of programs, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and quashing jaywalking tickets. And it was a fantastic thing. The program went away, uh, I think, around 2008 because the economy, just mm -hmm. as you stated. Right. Now, let's talk about the economy. I know a lot of people want to point to the economy for the surge in homelessness that we see in Skid Row. There's a small sect of the Skid Row community that is there because they lost their job or they're running from a... Uh, an abusive partner, mm -hmm. uh, these individuals aren't looking to put a cardboard box and sit up on the dangerous sidewalk. Uh, these are individuals who, when they do lose their apartments, I mean, I mean picture, put, your, put yourself in, your, in their shoes. If you lost your apartment today, uh, uh, would your first inclination be to come to Skid Row and set up a tent on a dirty urine-covered yeah. sidewalk with gang members coming around? Okay, yeah. so you understand what I'm saying. Right. So these right. folks are actively seeking services and wonderful people like Andy Bales and the missions take them in, they take their families in, and they usually stay about maybe six months, maybe to a year, and then they either get connected with family mm -hmm. or they, uh, the mission helped them get housing and or sent to Hope Guards or something like that. But for the vast majority of individuals uh, that we see in the streets, uh, they're not there because of the economy. I've known these individuals for 18 years. Mm -hmm. You know, some of these folks were <laughs> in the streets when, the economy was good back in the 90s, you know, uh, uh, when we recovered from that. Uh, sadly, we know across the United States of America that homelessness is due to these attributing factors. We have um, a lack of jobs, lack of uh, opportunities, recessions, mental health, and I'll throw in even a little racism. Uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people are behind the curve because of uh, uh, racism that's happened historically in this nation. Those are the top reasons. Uh, but in Skid Row, the driving force keeping the majority. And I always pretend there's a sign over my head that there's always an exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. But as long as the rule exists, I have to tell the truth. Um, majority of people in Skid Row are there because of addiction. And Skid Row is just a place you can come, use drugs, get slapped on the wrist, and continue to do it. And also, whatever your poison is, so to speak, or your medication is uh, that, uh, that you're self-medicating on, it's readily available. And you're more than willing to take an, uh, a beating to get that fix. You're more than willing to sell your body to get that fix or put up with X, Y, or Z to get what you need. That's the reality of Skid Row. And then you have the people who actually live in low-income supportive services like SRO, Skid Row Housing Trust, in my opinion, uh, the concept, great organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, but because Skid Row has been corrupt for so long, uh, sadly, individuals go into these programs and they end up... Uh, uh, making it difficult for the people who live inside who are actually trying to recover uh, to uh, uh, rehabilitate because of the activity. For instance. So they're taking advantage of the system, in other words. Absolutely. That's, that's set up there. I've heard that, that that definitely could happen. It can happen, and here's how. Okay. Many individuals who uh, I've housed, I've housed about 150 people in 10 years. Uh, now, that's a drop in the bucket because there's 2,000, but these are the 150 who were actually ready, who said, Joseph, I'm done. Some of these individuals ended up owing, already owing drug debts to loan sharks and gang members in the area. So when the gang members find out that, oh, you got a place at this hotel? Oh, really? Oh, great. Guess what? You still owe me money. I need you to help me turn this place out or work for me to work off your debt. Or if you still want some stuff, you can get a free sample if you turn this hotel out for me. So that's how the hotels and the uh, low income so far, and harm reduction hotels end up getting corrupt so fast in Skid Row. I'm not against the, the house first concept. Mm -hmm. I'm against it in Skid Row because the temptation to fail is just too great. Uh, anywhere else, it would be so successful. I mean, I've talked to people who says, oh, well, it's successful here. It's successful. I believe it, you know. Mm -hmm. Try to do that here in Skid Row. And, and I'm not speaking just as a cop. I'm speaking on behalf of the hundreds of people who live in Skid Row who call me every day and tell me this stuff is going on. But they're afraid to voice their opinion because they don't want to get uh, uh, blacklisted by <laughs> groups that are preaching a different narrative or threatened by gang members for, for coming forward. So that's the reality of Skid Row. But really, in Skid Row, there's four kinds of people, just like anywhere else in, in, in the nation. Uh, I have to say that off the top. There are good people, good, wonderful people trying to make it.
okay? There are good people who do bad things. These will be your addicts who, when they're sober, you'll find they're educated, they're talented, they're yes. wonderful, they're warm human beings. They have faith and all these wonderful things. But when they're going through their addiction, there's this Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde effect. Yes, there is. Yeah, I work with addicts on a regular basis so you, also. You know what I'm talking yes, about. Yes, definitely. Then you have people who are generally bad for the most part, but they have redemptive qualities. When we were able to clean the streets and make it safe, even they were inspired to say, you know what, maybe let's try something different. Let's, let's try to clean the community instead of hurt the community. And then you have, you know, for lack of a better term, predators who don't care about sobriety. Now, here's the difference between uh, Skid Row and other places in America. Because Skid Row is so concentrated, mm -hmm. there's this cross-contamination of all four of these groups where the good have to turn a blind eye so they don't be a witness and then a victim of crime, Okay. They're the silent majority who tell me all the time, please help us, please help us, but don't give my name. Mm -hmm. Then you have the good, the, the, uh, the good people who do bad things. They stay on the bad side more because, as I said, the temptation to fail is too great. I mean, you come out the courthouse, you get your Prop 36, and by the time you get down to Broadway and Second, you've already been offered heroin, weed, and methamphetamines, and you don't make it to the program, all right? But uh, for the bad guys who have redemptive qualities, they face with, they're faced with a choice. If I can't beat them, I might as well stay with them. Mm -hmm. And for the predators, they're the ones pulling all the strings, exploiting the conditions, and they're making all the money, and, and they're driving this whole thing. There are people who love to say narcotics addiction and sales are victimless crimes. That is the most false statement I've ever heard. Have you seen what an addict, and you know what I'm talking about, oh, will I do. do to get what they need? Do you know what drug dealers do to addicts? You know, when they don't pay them on time or, you know, if they <laughs> catch them, find out they're selling fake drugs on their street. Our crime is driven by narcotics addiction. And that's the truth that the world doesn't see about Skid Row. But the, being honest, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be in Skid Row if I didn't think that there were wonderful hundreds and hundreds of wonderful people that are worth uh, risking my life, risking my reputation, uh, being called a Nazi, the Gestapo. I've been called everything, but I don't care. Yeah. Uh, call me what you want, but I'll never stop caring about these people. You're trying to save them. I'm trying. And it's hard in this uniform. Yeah, I know. I'm it is very hard. And so are, so are many other dedicated officers who work since. Right, right. We are going to take a commercial break. When we come back, I would like to talk to you about what's happening in the tents, mm -hmm. what's happening with the overdose situation. I understand mm -hmm. that, that the statistic is going up. Yeah. Yes, it is. And yes, so we can come back to that in a minute, yes, right? Thank you. I'll be here. Therapy Cable is the missing piece in the puzzling question what is the role of the cyber world in healthcare? Therapy Cable has created a marketplace where healthcare finally meets technology in a consumer friendly way. We use online technology to bring together various entities of healthcare in one central place. It's easy to access from any internet platform. We provide educational videos on topics like acupressure, medicine, psychotherapy, and yoga. You can confidentially use this information in the privacy of your home. You can stay connected to the provider of your choice or even see your provider in person. Get started today at therapycable.com. And welcome back to Psych One on One with Julianne Good and Dr. Excuse me, Officer Dion Joseph. <laughs> doctor. Ooh. Doctor, would you like to have a oh, doctor? That's nice. <laughs> I have so many psychologists down here. It's just a natural go to. Wow, so, okay. yes, <laughs> Officer Joseph. So, we are talking about the situation in the Skid Row district of downtown LA. Yes, uh, it is a rather fascinating phenomenon. And, um, the Chicago School of Professional Psychology, which I did my master's at, does a lot of work with the Skid Row population. So mm -hmm. it's good to hear from you what's going on on the other side right. of the fence and in how everything integrates. Now, what is happening with the the, the tent population and, and how about how many people are, are approximating? We're, we're estimating about maybe 1,900 people who sleep in the streets of downtown LA. Um, uh, many in tents, many just sleep on the sidewalk. And um, years ago, there was an agreement uh, that was that allowed people with the understanding that there's not enough shelter beds uh, uh, to sleep from nine to six. And even prior to that agreement, we understood that. So at night, we let them sleep. Uh, but uh, from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m., they are supposed to pack up their tent, make the sidewalk clear. 
and, uh, and so the environment can be better. Once again, if we can't see them, we can't save them. That's the, that's the bottom line. And it helped uh, reduce crime. Now that the tents are back uh, uh, strong because of litig- litigation, and I can't talk about that. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, what we're seeing is an increase in all of our sites. Almost simultaneously between Prop 47 and the tents coming back, we saw a rise in crime in Skid Row in the, where the encampments were. And these crimes are ranged from aggravated assaults, robberies, and even rapes uh, and overdosing. Uh, I talked to someone from the fire department, and um, uh, he gave me some rough uh, estimate of the increase. And he said that they were seeing a, uh, a 30% increase in uh, overdosing. Uh, you know, it, it was really disheartening for one gentleman I talked to uh, uh, on Facebook from the fire station. He says, Dion, what I'm seeing out there is is inhuman. Uh, we can't see them. We're opening the tents to people overdosing and we're almost too late, almost too late. Um, so is this happening like on a daily basis? Daily. It's a daily, it's a daily thing. Uh, uh, you know, I've seen people, you know, uh, laying out. If you see somebody laying on the sidewalk, uh, breathing once every few seconds, that'll, that'll shatter your reality about what's happening down here. They're dying from a heroin overdose. The, uh, the, uh, uh, it's taking over their receptors and it's shutting their bodies down. And then uh, thankfully the fire department comes along most of the time and shoots them with a magical product called Narcan. Mm-hmm. And in five to seven seconds, uh, boom, they wake up and, uh, and uh, only to repeat the cycle again. Uh, but the rapes are what concern me the, uh, the most. It all concerns me, but I'm a huge, huge advocate for the women in Skid Row and what they go through. As a matter of fact, in 2008, um, I created a grassroots program with the blessing of the department uh, called Ladies' Night. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now, Ladies' Night started in October of 2008, but it was birthed in 1999 when I worked as an undercover vice investigator. My job was to arrest prostitutes. Now, I don't like the word prostitutes. I like the word human trafficking because, you know, a lot of the women are victims. And, you know, a lot of women didn't really choose that, you know, for various reasons, whether they're scarred emotionally or drugs led them to that. But... Back then, it was called prostitution. So one night, I'm driving through Agatha (laughs) and uh, 8th, and I see a girl uh, who I believe is working and pull up next to her. She offered to uh, have a date with me, and when she looks at me, her right eye was completely swollen shut. Her shirt had been ripped, and she was bleeding between her legs. And I broke cover. I said, ma'am, look, yes, I'm a police officer. I was working you, but listen, I want to help you. What happened to you? Please tell me. And she said, you know what? It's part of the game. You either arrest me or get the heck out of my face. I ain't no snitch. These women were told by not only advocates, but told by gangsters, their johns, that if you go to the police for help and you are prostituting or a drug addict, you're going to be criminalized. If you have a little warrant, they're going to take you to jail. And they believed it for years. And at that time, I didn't know it. So I was very disheartened. So in October of 2008, we had a series of uh, rapes occurring. There was a serial taxicab rapist uh, 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 picking up uh, women on uh, 7th Street and doing horrible things to them. And on top of that, women were coming to me complaining, saying, I'm walking down the street and these men are grabbing me by the butt and by the breast, and what can I do? So I started a program called Ladies' Night. And because of the rapport I built with the community, I have a wonderful relationship with Skid Row. Uh, the wonderful people at SRO allowed me to use the James Ed Woods Center. Now I packed out, put out 50 chairs, right? But I really was only expecting five women to show up. Uh, 175 women oh. from Skid Row came throughout the night. And sadly, some of them had to leave because they had to check into the missions and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And I took that opportunity <clears throat> to tell them that I don't care if you're a preacher or a prostitute. I don't care if you're an actress or an addict. You have a fundamental right to report rape and domestic violence and sex crimes committed against you. We don't judge. We serve. The scales are not unbalanced with us. And that broke something in a lot of the women because mm-hmm. three of the victims of the taxi cab rapist came to the first ladies' night. And they had been violated by him three weeks or a couple months before. And they said, Joseph, I thank you for telling me this. This is what happened to me. And as a result of ladies' night, three of, I think, the five victims came forward and we were able to put this man away because now these women felt empowered. And I've been doing ladies' night since then, uh, probably to about for about 800 women, uh, not just in Skid Row. Sometimes they call me out to South LA or wherever. Mm-hmm. They call me, I'm there. But it, so how often does that occur? And it, 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 is it on a regular basis that that happens? Because that would be really good information to put out to the community. Here's an interesting thing. When the streets, and this is not just for downtown LA, this is for everywhere in the United States of America. 
listen, if you're living in, in, in communities that are riddled with crime, and it just goes to show how important it is to work with and not fight against your law enforcement agency. Right. When police agencies are able to do their job and give you safety, we are allowed to show you who we are, not just what we do. And when Skid Row was clean, I was able to create these wonderful programs and officers were able to show them who we are, that we do care. When I'm chasing call to call to call, you don't know that I care, you know, because I have to scoop one bad guy up, take him to jail, come back, scoop, and it just looks like I'm a jerk taking all your friends to jail. And I understand how that perception can happen. Uh, so that's what's happening now. You know, I'd love to do ladies' night a lot more. It, it, it was pretty consistent. Sometimes I do it once a month or once every three months. Now it's fewer and far between because now I'm figuring out how to put my finger in the dam to stop women and men and the mentally ill from being destroyed out there. And uh, so it's unfortunate. But, yeah, I still do it. I just did it uh, a couple weeks ago at the uh, Abbey Apartments. They requested me. I have another group in South LA that wants me to come speak. And uh, just today I met with another lady that wants me to speak. So it's on call. You call me, I'll do everything I can uh, in spite of the how busy we are to try to get there and mentor the women. It's so important. It's good information. And then what do you do about teaching them do you teach them coping skills to protect themselves on the streets? Absolutely. Not only uh, coping skills, self-defense. And when I say self-defense, I'm not going to teach them how to be an MMA fighter or the Matrix. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what I, I, the moves that I show them and my twin brother show them, uh, 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 shout out to Sergeant Joseph Wilson Division. <laughs> He's my twin. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we did ladies night together. Uh, we, we teach them maneuvers to add seconds to their lives mm -hmm. uh, if they are attacked. And we also encourage them to go take self-defense, uh, like how to get out of chokeholds or one-arm grabs or a guy grabbing you around the throat. Uh, and then we also, uh, recently I uh, brought Peace Over Violence and our DART team, our domestic violence response team, uh, to come and speak to the ladies and to talk about the services they offer. You know, a lot of women, you know, some of them don't trust the police. That's that's what I was going to ask you about the trust issue mm -hmm. because I had worked with some homeless vets mm -hmm. up in L.A. And some of the stories that they told me, it was just like, you know, we don't trust certain people mm -hmm. in the helping community yeah. because we've had so many negative situations happen over the years. Mm -hmm. So how do you work to rebuild that trust so that you can help them and they can get the assistance that they need? Well, that takes time. And I was able to do that. Uh, there's 11 principles, but I know we don't have time to go through all of them, that I've used uh, called grassroots policing. And the first thing that I did when I became a senior lead officer was this. And it was the most important thing that any officer can do. Uh, to change this game narrative nationwide is I, I left my worldview at my locker. Uh, and, and by saying that, I mean, I'm a born again Christian, proud of it. But if a Muslim, a Jewish person, or even somebody of the atheist face says, Officer Joseph, I need your help. It's my duty to go above and beyond to help you. I am straight as a bone. But let me find out that someone from the LBGT community was abused because how they live. I promise you the suspect's going to have a 250 pound legal problem on their hands. Because that's wrong. That's wrong. Yes. People have a right to live how they want to live. Uh, if you're undocumented, I'm a born, I'm, I'm, I'm an American citizen. But please, let me find out you abused somebody and told them you were threatening to get La Migra on them. I'm, it's my job to put my uh, uniform on and let these, proactively let these people know that, no, I will not arrest you. That's on a whole nother level. On my level, if you get raped and you're undocumented, it's my job to tell you that I'm here to serve you. And I practiced that on a daily basis until it became second nature. It made me a better person on duty and off duty. Uh, and as a result, people start to sense that. The other thing is I stay available, okay? I don't just come out here, smile, wave, kiss babies, and leave. I stay out there, or before crime went crazy, I was out there every day walking the beat, mm -hmm. talking to people, shaking hands, putting people in drug programs, working with the services, and I became a familiar face. Remember, familiarity builds trust. Yes. What's the base word of familiar? Family. Yes. I became family. It's so funny. When I leave on, <laughs> on vacation <laughs> and come back, to people are like, Joseph, where the heck did you go? It's been crazy around here. Uh, one funny story on that. Uh, we had a gentleman uh, uh, who owed a uh, loan shark $500. Mm -hmm. And she said, Joseph, uh, you saved my life while you were gone. I was like, uh, how the heck did I do that? I'm on vacation playing PlayStation 4. <laughs> and he goes, uh, well, a loan shark uh, uh, threatened to uh, have his people come to my door and uh, break my legs. I said, okay. And he says, uh, well, I told him I was going to call the police. And the guy just laughed at me. And I was like, oh, really? And he said, but then I sat back and I told him, 
well, I'm gonna call Officer Joseph. And you get and the and the loan shark says, Don't get that big Negro involved. You, know, just, <laughs> hey, you got two more weeks. So, you have a reputation. <laughs> so, and they know, they know they can call me and they know they can uh-huh. call other officers. I can name off the top of my head, Officers mm-hmm. Lanier, Hutchins, Officers Brunson, Popham. They know they uh, Tapia, all these great officers who they know they trust. So you have to build that trust over the years and you have to show and prove. Uh you have to go above and beyond because these people are used to being marginalized and 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 cast aside. So, you know. Just as you would your favorite celebrity. If you found out something happened to some famous uh, pop icon, agencies just go crazy trying to figure out what happened to them. Mm-hmm. I treat them just like that. For instance, we had a young lady uh, who uh, was walking down the street, and I knew her, and she was walking with a very pronounced limp. Her eye was swollen this big, and, uh, and, I, and I knew her husband. I said, uh, uh, what happened to you? She said her husband took a cane and beat her, took her cane from her and beat her uh, uh, just savagely. Uh, I told her, where's he at? You know, let me go get him. And a lady came from behind the mission wall and said, Joseph, you ain't going to do crap, right? Mm-hmm. And I looked at her like, do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> right? You know, my ego got there. <laughs> so I told the lady, you stay right there. And I told my friend, stay right there. I went to the place. I went up there, uh, knocked on the man's door. Hey, how you doing? Shook his hand, put handcuffs on him, brought him to the station. But I had to do one thing, one thing before I took him to jail. I uh, left him on the bench and I took the cane. I went back to San Julian behind the mission, and I got on my PA and said, hey, where's the lady who said I wasn't going to do crap? And they all come out, right? And I popped the trunk, and I raised up the cane, and all those ladies were crazy, you know? <laughs> For some reason at that point, they believed, they, they felt love from a place that they had been indoctrinated not to expect it. And from there, just people just started depending on me. My phone kept ringing. You're a good senior lead officer when, when the homeless call you in the middle of the night, yeah. you know, because they trust you. And that's, that's a sign you're doing your job. And they feel that you're protecting them and actually living up to your word. Yes. And it's not, it's not for show. Right. It's not for hype. It's genuine. You, you, you mess with one of my peeps in Skid Row, I'm coming for you. They know that. Yeah. They know that. But that's become very difficult now with the rise in crime. But I'm still trying. Yeah, and especially, I I used to work at a domestic violence shelter Mm -hmm. and talked to a a lot of the police officers from Lakewood, Mm -hmm. and they they told me that that's one of the most dangerous calls that they can go on. Oh, absolutely. So unpredictable. And I've been on many of those where, of course, uh, you know, and every cop has this story because it's true, where you go to protect the victim, and then next you know she's on your back because you're destroying her family. And I talk about that during Ladies' Night. Yeah. Uh, and why we're not trying to destroy your family. You know, when we take your abuser into custody and we offer you emergency protective orders and all these things in shelters, we're offering you time to think about what's going on in your life and make better decisions. Uh, you know, we know it's hard to leave. You know, I, I mean, back in the day, years ago, people would come on and say, hey, why don't you just leave? That's completely ignorant. It, yeah, that's not as easy said as done. When you love somebody, there are people who love their children and their children are robbing them in their sleep, but they can't stop loving their children. Right. You know, uh, right. I'm sure Jeffrey Dahmer's parents thought he was a good boy, <laughs> you know, even though he had human body parts in his freezer, right. you know, and, and it's the same thing with relationships. When you fall in love with somebody, it's really hard. And then sometimes that person is your, be, becomes your lifeline or they make you feel like you're all, they're all you have. About they take your credit card, they control your finances, control who you see. You can't even go see your parents, you know, anymore. Don't go to your mama's house because your mama don't like me. Well, that's a trick because if they keep you away from the one person who's going to defend you, then what? Don't go to your friend Tanika's house because I heard she's, uh, you know, loose and all kind of stuff like that. Well, she may be loose, but she could have that safe place where you can go, you know, and they want to take all that away from you. Take your credit cards, take your money where you control everything. They control you completely. And, mm-hmm. and that's what I try to break them up in Skid Row to let them know that it gets better it gets better as soon as you realize that you, as soon as you get free. Right. As soon as you get free. And take action. Yes. That's absolutely. it. That is the key component to getting out of the situation. Yes, ma'am. Yes, no ma'am. No matter what it is, addiction, homelessness, domestic, domestic violence. violence. Yep. You bet. It's that action. Yep. We are going to be back in a little while. We are going to finish this up. This is very interesting. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. The Chicago School of Professional Psychology offers numerous psychology, behavioral, and health-related science graduate degrees at three campuses, Los Angeles, California, including branches in Westwood and Irvine, Chicago, Illinois, and Washington, D.C., and online. The Chicago School prepares students to meet the ever-changing mental health needs of society through classroom experience and real-world training. 
Chicago School Counseling Centers in Irvine and Westwood provide caring, confidential, and affordable psychological services to individuals and their families. For more information, visit thechicagoschool.edu. Welcome back to Psych 101 with Julianne Good and Officer Dion Joseph. We are concluding on our discussion about the Skid Row population. He is a lead officer for working directly with the population and doing fantastic work. Oh, thank you. Now, what is happening along the lines of mental illness yeah, that's, yeah, absolutely. That's the big one. Uh, and it's always been a challenge. Uh, you know, when we have support, we're able to reduce crime. And of course, when the justice system is fighting against us, that's difficult. But the one challenge we never could really get a hold on was mental illness because in America, the solution to mental illness is to sprinkle pills on somebody in the name of uh, civil liberties and clap your hands like you did something and release them into the street uh, uh, to no support. Now, some of them, they link up with family members and they have support. But then for many, they fall through the cracks and end up or end up in Skid Row or get dumped into Skid Row. And what happens when they get to Skid Row, uh, unlike the average person, if you have a, have a heart problem and you run out of your pills, what do you do? You go to ACA, you go to Kaiser or wherever, and you get your refill. Well, someone struggling with extreme bipolar, extreme paranoia, paranoia schizophrenia, you want to feel better fast. So when you run out of your pills, you don't have the wherewithal to do that. So who's there to medicate you when you come to Skid Row? The Crips and the Bloods, unfortunately. And they give you crack cocaine, meth, and spice, and these things exacerbate their conditions. Mental illness is not a crime. Every law enforcement officer you'll talk to will tell you it's not a crime to be mentally ill. But when mental illness meets spice, meth, crack, now we have a chemical buffer that's preventing us from getting to the core issue, which is the mental illness, and that's why you end up in uses of force and fights and things that, that we don't want to be involved in it's not for a lack of training or a lack of compassion. It's just when that chemical buffer is in play, it's nearly impossible to get a lot of these people. And still, in spite of that, we still do a good job of reducing uh, using force, but sometimes it doesn't it, it doesn't work. Right. Yeah. And it, it's trying to break through that drug-induced yes. state of yes. mind. Sometimes that's that's near impossible, especially yeah. if it polysubstance use. Yeah. You yeah. know, yeah. um 
the meth on top of the heroin, yep. on top of the pot, yep. on, to yep. on top of the alcohol, and it goes on and on. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you don't know where the core of that person really is, and you're trying to break through to that element. It's so funny because before spice and meth came into play about four years ago, there'd be a guy I know who likes to get naked and stand on top of buildings, and i say, hey, buddy, hey, it's me, get down here. And he'd look at me and go, Joseph, I'm having an episode. Oh, really? I see that. Why don't you come on down? Well, for you... I'll do it. And he'll come down, put his clothes on, or, you know, we do what we need to do. But with spice and meth, they're not listening anymore. I know people who I've known for years, and then when they're going through it in their crisis plus addiction, they don't recognize me. And that's why it, it bothers me so deeply that, you know, we're slapping drug dealers on the Ritz, wrist in Skid Row. I understand addic the addicts, mm -hmm. but the drug dealers who purposely come down here to prey on these individuals, we want to consider that a non-serious crime. That bothers me because we're so looking for that universal solution, but when there are specifics and layers you need to look at before you make these decisions and start slapping these guys on the wrist and sending a drug dealer to a drug program, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Now, the saddest part about mental illness is if they don't end up in confrontations with us, Sometimes they end up in confrontations with other people where they get seriously hurt or hurt other people. Uh, I'm an anecdotal guy, sorry. But uh, a friend of mine, I'll call her Margaret, a uh, wonderful lady. When she's taking her pills, she, you find out she's a poet. She's college educated. Uh, but when she's binging on crack, she's Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. One time I responded to a hotel in Skid Row on 6th and Spring. We get to the fourth floor and two women had been stabbed uh, savagely with a pair of uh, sewing scissors. You know, sewing scissors are small, mm -hmm. but this lady did a lot of damage. And I asked the woman who was able to talk, I said, ma'am, who did this to you? And she looks over and points down the hall and I see my friend, Margaret. I'm telling you, when I call her my friend, she was my friend. Sitting, sweating, laughing in states of mania, bloody scissors in one hand, crack pipe in the other and an empty bottle of pills in her jacket. Mm. Okay. I had to arrest my friend for a violent crime. I sent my friend to prison, okay, where she's, she was getting help, but in a prison cell. And then once she's released, obviously kicked back out into the street. Now, I know from a public safety and a uh, legal standpoint, she committed a crime. I had to do it. But morally, you're listening to an LAPD officer, and many officers will tell you that was morally wrong. The common, the, the, the thing they give us to, to, a system mentally ill is a three-pronged approach, and that's if they're a danger to themselves, mm -hmm. a danger to others, and gravely disabled. But there's a common theme with all three of those prongs, and that's we have to wait until it's damn near too late to reach them. And oftentimes it is too late. That is inhumane. And then they say, oh, put them on a 72-hour hold. You cannot put somebody who's dual diagnosis on a 72-hour hold because even with somebody who's suffering with extreme bipolar or schizophrenia, it takes two weeks for the prescribed meds to take effect or longer. Yes, it does. And then they have to be compliant yes. with it. That is the issue is that I don't want to be on these medications. They're making me feel weird mm -hmm. or I can't afford them mm -hmm. or it's on and on and on. I do not want to take these medications. Yes. And they're right back to the state and they are right back to using the illegal substances. They don't even stay for 72 hours. They yeah. get some pills. They look at them and say, you feeling better? Sure. And they release them. Now, you are given some stuff to bring you down, mm -hmm. but you like crack because you like how it makes you go up. So many of these people leave the hospital, sell their pills, and then go back down to Skid Row, self-medicate on the hard stuff. And then once again, we end up sending them right back. They end up being repeat victims of crime as well as repeat suspects in crime. And that's where I need our government to, okay, you don't want to talk to me, fine. But find somebody who doesn't have a political agenda and talk to them, who doesn't have a dog in the fight or is trying to push some ideology. And But they need to talk to someone like me who sees it firsthand and so we can come up with some real uh, common sense, non-political solutions to uh, to uh, help these individuals on a long term basis. Yeah. And I don't want to see options. Yeah. I don't want to see the asylums come back. From what I heard, uh, they were inhumane. You know, they were horribly ran. Uh, but what I do want to see is maybe uh, instead of 72 hours, maybe two weeks. Mm -hmm. I mean, and still that's not enough. But the first week, detox them, you know, build a rapport with them and then medicate them, and get them stabilized. And maybe once you develop that rapport. Get in contact with their loved ones or family members and try to 
uh, get conservatorship with uh, Laura's Law or LPS. And, and right. these are common sense. And then if it doesn't work, okay, you've tried. You've right. Tried. And, and can you explain Laura's Law? That just went into place, correct? It, it went into place. I don't know all the nuances about it, but what I know, it, it's it's giving some families hope that they can get some uh, some some conservatorship over their loved one if they've gotten to such a state. Matter of fact, it happened recently where I helped a family with working with NAMI, a wonderful organization. Oh, that's a, that's a great organization. Uh, yeah, I, I got training underneath them for working with with schizoph- schizophrenic patients yeah. and their families. Yeah. And I know Laura's Law really hits up for schizophrenic patients, yes. correct? Yes, because as we know with schizophrenic pa- patients, they're hearing multiple voices in their head mm-hmm. and the voices are calling them horrible things, uh, don't listen, fight, fight, run, 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 especially if they see a police officer, you know. Uh, you know, but I like that. Uh, when I met uh, Nami, uh, I ran into this family who was looking for their daughter. And her daughter would routinely run down Skid Row with a knife in her hand and take off her clothes, butt naked, running around. That's somebody who needed help. Yes. <laughs> okay. And uh, I, one day she uh, was walking around with a knife and we were able to bring her in custody. And it was a fight for me to get uh, uh, people to actually hold her for a longer period of time. And we did that. And I was able to call NAMI and the family was reunited with her daughter. And they finally got conservatorship. And that shows the police and uh, mental health experts and families working together, networking. To me, that's the, beautiful, be- the most beautiful model, you know, because that's what I want to do. Reunification and everybody working together. I don't want to shoot. Yes. I don't want to shoot your loved one. I don't want to fight with your loved one on a urine soaked sidewalk. I don't want to hurt them. You know, I want to save them. You know, but because the way the system is set up, not because I don't have compassion. Unfortunately, fights are happening and bad things are happening. But it's not a, a, a police issue, so to speak. It is a system, a failure of a system, a failure of our government in uh, really doing more proactive uh, uh, outreach to dementia. But here's some good news. Uh, uh, I wrote an article in 2014 titled uh, Skid Row, a Mental Health State of Emergency. And uh, I thought I was going to get in trouble for it because <laughs> 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 technically we're not supposed to have an opinion, you know. Mm-hmm. But I, I couldn't stand it anymore. A uh, um, gentleman from the gay community was stabbed. Uh, he was mentally unstabbed uh, eight times mm-hmm. and he died eight months later. Uh, uh, so I was inspired to write. And that article uh, was the catalyst for getting things started with uh, city and county starting to work together and and uh, first it was Operation Healthy Streets and having us and case managers, the police and case managers walking together because uh, we knew, we were the first responders. We knew where to find it. Oh, you're going to help? Okay, I know just where to take you. And it, it really, really helps. Matter of fact, the first two days, the first day they tried to go out without us, they only were able to, two minutes, we were uh, only able to, they were only able to get two people signed up for services. Mm-hmm. When I joined them the second day, we got 16. So there's a myth out there that if the police work with them, oh, it's going to scare the people. That is so false because many of the police officers that I work with, they have special relationships with individuals in Skid Row, and they tr- they do trust us. Now there's a program called C3. Uh, unfortunately, we don't work hand-in-hand with C3 like we did in Operation Healthy Streets, but they are proactively going out and trying to house about 2,000 people in four years. They're trying to get 250 people this year. And like I said, I, even though I'm not working directly with them as I'd like, uh, I am sending people their way, and uh, and it's right across the street from our station. So if somebody comes in the station with a problem, we can direct them. But it, there's a lot of challenges. That, but but talk to us, talk to us, you know. And we we're going to be honest and uh, and just to help. We want to help. We want to help. Okay. So if any of the listeners would like to contact you for coming and speaking. Mm-hmm. Or doing ladies' night, how can they contact you? Okay, uh, well, you can contact me at 213-793-0740 or email me at 32511 at lapd.lacity.org. Uh, I'm on Twitter, too, uh, at Dion Joseph, uh, D-E-O-N-J-O-S-E-P-H. Uh, so I'd love to do it. Hit me up. Uh, I can't go too far. i got to stay in L.A. boundaries, but uh, unless I get the blessing of my commander. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, I will travel to you to empower uh, you wherever you are, and I promise you're going to have a great time. We'll laugh, uh, we'll cry, and we'll learn how to kick a little butt too. <laughs> exactly, exactly, and get some better coping skills in place. Yes, right. That's what it's all about: That's what coping it's all about. skills and actions, and faith and hope. Yep. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> it's fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's wonderful. And if you would like to contact me. My email is jgoode8 at verizon.net. My business number is 
209-1837. My office is down in Santa Ana, California. I specialize in trauma treatment and working with dual diagnosis, drug and substance abuse issues. So please contact me. I would love to reach out and help you. And if you have any suggestions for Psych 101, please reach out and also contact me on that. So this is Julianne Good. This has been Psych 101. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Bye now. Thank you.